Hello, everyone. Welcome to Dial the Gate, the Stargate Oral History Podcast. We're at episode 175. My name is David Reed. Thank you so much for joining me. I am really excited about this episode. Uh, Tor Valenza, uh, one of the early writers of Stargate SG-1, is joining us to dive into his episodes from Spirits and Holiday to Ergo and uh, Divide and Conquer, if we get to them. So we're, we're going to see how many episodes we can get through because we have a lot to catch up on with him in terms of where he's been since Stargate first. Before uh, we get into uh, the thick of it, if you enjoy Stargate, and you want to see more content like this on YouTube, please click that like button. It helps promote the show. Also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click the subscribe icon. And giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops. And you'll get my notifications of any last minute guest changes. And clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next uh, few weeks on the Dial the Gate and GateWorld.net YouTube channels. As this is a live episode, Tor is with me now to discuss uh, 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 his careers, plural, and uh, time on, most importantly, time on Stargate. The moderators, I've got uh, Anthony and Tracy in there today uh, fielding your questions for Tor. So you can check out his Stargate uh, wiki page and uh, see which episodes he was involved in uh, and submit questions to him. Or it doesn't have to be Stargate related. It can be also about his his solar world as well uh, and his podcast. But um, let's just go ahead and get into it. Tor Alexander Valenza, as he was known uh, during his time on Stargate SG-1. Tor, where do I get a name like that? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, you I'm have not to a cool have... name. My name is David. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I should have been a Frank or a John, but <laughs> it was the, the, uh, the late 60s, and my parents were kind of uh, creative people, and <laughs> they did not want... A, a common name and as the story goes they were watching like the end credits of the seventh seal or something like that <laughs> and they saw tor and they looked at each other and they went hmm that's very original it's it's not thor you know but it, it, it which are the same things the right. same names actually it's just different ironically um my dad um you know later divorced my 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 mom and did marry a Norwegian woman. Isn't that and interesting? So I have two siblings who now live in Norway. And, you know, when I go over there, um, you know, it's like Tor is like John. I mean, it, it's it's all over the place. Over <laughs> wow. here, when I order, you know, Starbucks and everything, they go, huh? What? And everything. So I, I love going over there to visit them. They're great people and um anyway and and you know and they pronounce my name in very different ways. it's Tuch, you know it's got a guttural <laughs> sound very very strong something that probably should have been on stargate um, uh, that's, maybe, that's thank so you cool. for having me i just i i'm really excited this is actually my first time being interviewed about stargate since i left and so i i do want to warn your audience that my memory is pretty thin but you say you have a magic ability to draw those out maybe i'll just make things up so. it's a superpower you know oh i don't know my bs meter is pretty strong so as certain as long as it comes to stargate but we'll see it is it is a privilege to have you it is a um it is it is a shame to hear that you've not been interviewed since since your time on stargate the one of the reasons that i've done this show uh aside from our tagline, the Stargate Oral History Project, is you know, so many of these earlier stories about Stargate are locked away in these magazines. A lot of them German. Germany was had a big Stargate yeah. publication going yeah. for a while. And unless you have them, you can't you won't know them. And so a lot of my effort here is to bring a lot of these older stories and anecdotes into the modern audience for the whole world and for free. Uh, and that's what that's what we're doing here. So I appreciate you joining. I appreciate you creating this this format. It's wonderful. So how did you? I've been watching uh, your your show, probably True Solar, your podcast, and we've got that up here uh, on the screen, uh, and I've got a link to it in the description for the episode as well. Um, hey. How did you fall into this uh, this career and your love for this burgeoning technology? So 
in a lot of ways, um, it's it's it, the, the podcast is called Probably True Solar Stories. Um, but um, fun fact is that um, I wanted to be a solar engineer when I was a kid. Um, and then I took um, basically calculus and physics and I realized I was not going to be a solar engineer. But I did have an imagination. Yeah. And um, so, I mean, my in, in terms of my, you know, Stargate and, and writing origin story. Um, so I, again, I, I kind of like really crashed and burned in my AP exams and in, in physics and, um, and, and calculus in, in my senior year of high school. Um, but I did always, I was always creating stories and things like that. So I went to, um, a place, a small college in New England called Middlebury College, and they had a burgeoning film program that basically allowed me to do anything that I wanted. I mean, I had to take some basic courses and things like that, but they had a camera and they just gave it to me. And um, and I could create my own, like my my junior thesis was writing scripts, you know, so I was like, OK, you know, great. Um, and I got really inspired by a professor there named um, Ted Perry. I, w- I was intending to major in English, but Ted um, just you know, his film courses just opened my eyes. Like I love telling screen stories. And so uh, anyway, I got to do whatever I wanted there and created a lot of terrible films, you know, looking, looking back, back then in, start in, somewhere, in quarter man. inch videos. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, they're disintegrating on VHS in, in my closet somewhere. <laughs> Um, so even if I wanted to look back, uh, it might be tough to, to do that. Um, anyway, but I, I graduated and, um, I had the choice of, you know, go to New York and maybe, you know, had, get an advertising job while I kind of write scripts or go to LA. And, um, so my sister, um, also was in the biz. She, she was, a an actress who was known for um, old soaps called um, All My Children. Mm. And she had um, just other kind of movies. She was actually in a movie with Sean Penn um, a long, long time ago in in his earlier career. Um, So, you know, she invited me to sleep on her couch. Um, But cross country, when I was driving over there, I took three weeks to just explore the U.S. while I was going over. And I got this idea for a road movie. And when I got to my sister's place, I wrote that in three weeks. And this is you have to understand, this was my fourth um, full length screenplay that I had ever written. So I had three really terrible ones. But this one and she's my twin. And so she she typically hated anything and everything that I wrote um, and wasn't afraid to tell me so. Um, but this one, she couldn't stop reading it. And it was really just like, you know, a winner in her mind. I thought, oh, maybe I've got something here. And I used some Middlebury connections and a combination of her connections um, to finally find an agent, um, yeah, which was at that time called Leading Artist, and then it eventually became um, United Talent Agency, which is okay. a kind of agency these days. Um, and um, one of the people that was part of that uh, was my agent, Rob's agent, um, Rob, Rob Rothman. And um, just, you know, I my first years as a screenwriter were just in film. Like, that's all I was doing was like trying to make this this uh, this road movie, um, it got options several times. And, you know, it's one of those things that still would, would do well today, I think. But you know how Hollywood is. It's just really difficult to, to make those things. And um, I guess in 1998, late 1998 or so, um, SG, uh, it was then, I think Jonathan Glassner was actually Rob's client. Um, okay. And then... Brad joined eventually, and then, um, and then by that time, you know the the agency had. Uh, I mean, Rob had split away from UTA and gone with his own agency, um, which was then known as the Rothman Agency. I'm not sure what it's called now. I think it's the Rothman Brecker something else agency. 
Um, but anyway, hope this isn't boring for your your fans. But um, yeah, just um, they said they were looking for um, some type of you know a, a new writer to join the show up in Canada, mm -hmm. and apparently it was very difficult to get people up there. Um, I had kind of crashed and burned on another spec script that I had just written and I loved and it just you know wasn't sold again and I was going like wow man and um, he said well you know if your goal is to get things made you should start looking at television and I did want that's what I wanted to do was like you know it was one thing for agents and producers to be reading my scripts it was another thing to actually get those translated into you know actual actors saying your lines and and everything happening out of that so this was like the first time that i considered you know going from film to television which i think you know again back then i think tv has much more of a cachet than it did back mm -hmm. then i think you know we're now i think many in, in many ways like the golden really truly golden age of television agreed um and this was on Showtime. I wasn't uh, I wasn't a subscriber to Showtime, but Rob gave me all of the um, episodes. And I said, OK, you know, I'll check it out and, and see. Are we it. talking and Rob Cooper at this point? No, no, no. Sorry. Rob Rothman. Rob Rothman. Um, still, OK. My, my agent. Um, and um, or it might have been Lucy Stutz. Anyway, one of one of the two that that were over there at, at the time. And um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I and and I was a huge Star Trek fan, so I thought, okay, another Star thing. I wonder how derivative this is going to be. <laughs> and um, I saw, you know, all of these episodes essentially. Uh, I guess they were, yeah, I think they were on VHS. They might have been DVD. But were you familiar um, with the film? The the film I was already familiar with. Yeah, the the film I was. And I liked it. I, it wasn't like my favorite thing in the world. But when I, I, th I think I get this from a lot of people when I tell them that I wrote for Stargate. And, and, and I had the same reaction, which was like, wow, this is really good. <laughs> I, I did not expect it to be really well done. I thought it was going to be a a kind of you know space soap opera of some sort, which in many ways it, it kind of is, but it's done in this humorous, uh, really well done way with great production values and everything else. So uh, from there, um, you know, I said, yeah, I'd, I'd love to to be involved with this. And I talked to my wife at the time, and she didn't mind moving up to to Vancouver. Um, so then it was a matter of pitching, right? So, and this was a I was just telling you uh, earlier off screen. So I was trying to find how I came up with Spirits, um, which was my first episode. And um, unfortunately, I wrote my, I, I used to journal every day. And, and if you're a writer watching this, please, please, please write every day. That's the only way that things that you get improved and things like that, whether that's a journal or just your, you know, 500 words of your fiction, mm -hmm. writing every day is is the way to just, the, that's how the muse talks to you. Um, you, you. You know, you got you can take your breaks and, and think about things, but that doesn't matter. Just sit down and write every day and you'll be surprised at what comes up and sparks out. And that's that's how I meditated every day was doing this so i was looking up these trying to look up these journals how i came up but it was written in um uh word perfect an old word word processing form and microsoft word is just not um somehow translating that in 2025 so i can't tell you how i came up with <laughs> it, originally um but I, I i do remember looking i think because they told me that well, this was, takes place in Vancouver, and it's going to be, you know, a lot of these things are. And I saw that a lot of things were filmed around that, you know, kind of green foresty area that um, somehow all all the planets are known for. Um, then, 
Um, and so I just started looking and, and I knew also that it was a, that's, that's, that's kind of how it is. I, again, you're right. You, you, you draw it out, David. Uh, so, you know, okay. What kind of uh, ancient culture was, a, is around Vancouver. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what I started thinking of. Well, the native Indians were definitely the first nations as they, they call them up in Canada were, were up there. And so I just started looking at that. And I thought of, okay, what if aliens were pretending to be animals and protecting these things? All right. I do have actually a surprise that I can actually show you something. Um, oh, boy. Yeah. This, this, is, this is a, a fun thing, but I got to turn off my background solar screen here. Okay. Uh, one second. None. Okay. So, I see bicycle. That's this. I have a bicycle. Yes, I have a great um, old Ostradamer. My my favorite thing that I I used to race when I was a kid. Hey, there you go. And he's gone. So, <laughs> Ooh, what do we got? I don't know if ah, knows. yes, the but, concept art for the totem poles. Yes, that is the original totem pole design. Wow. And Zell, the Zakaya, the Jaffa. I'm sorry? Yeah, the set designers gave me this um, because it was my first episode. And, and I, you know, I just said, is there anything that can come in? Not only that, they gave me the arrow that shot um, that, that shot Richard Dean Anderson. Yes. Before. One that was supposed to, that they that they got out of that's that's uh, made out of uh, trinium. That's so, correct. That's yeah. so cool. So I got all that. I did break that a little bit, but yeah, I keep that on my wall as a as a fun reminder. Uh, um, yeah, good, good stuff. That's great. It's love. It's great to have memorabilia. Like I have a I have a print of that concept art, but the trinium era. That's really cool, Tor. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, they're well, both cool. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's um, so, yeah, that 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 happened. And the other anecdote that I very clearly remember out of, uh, well, anyway, to continue the story, I, I so I wrote a treatment. That's how, the, that's how the process went back then. And lo and behold, they liked the treatment. And um, so the next step was, you know, write, write the script. Mm-hmm. So I wrote the script. And they liked it, and so I got hired as a story editor, and, and you know, whatever later senior story editor. And you know, they brought me up in the middle of the season, um, season two, to uh, to go to Vancouver. So and spirits was, was the trigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that was the you know the freelance. There were there were a lot of freelancers, and you know for whatever reason they didn't make the cut. And thank goodness I I made the cut um, with with finishing that script and and they definitely you know as executive producers do it's their show so it's their vision and and you can't get it perfect and so we always work together and they always kind of massage things and smooth things out and i think brad you know cleaned up the script a little bit but um here we are um but the other anecdote that i remember from this again i was really excited finally i was going to get something made you know in you know, it, it just, it wasn't going to stay on the script. And I said, can I be in the production meeting? And I said, sure, you know, come on to the production meeting where they had the first script read and everything else. And um, there was, you know, and and then again, it was a script reading. So they always read the, the, the descriptions in the middle. And when um, uh, Zales first appears as the wolf, um, before he does, Zales is the uh, is the bird. Sorry, sorry, not Takaya is the Takaya is the wolf. Takaya, Takaya is the wolf. Sorry, see, Again, you're you know good. Than I am. Um, you know, I wrote in the description, um, an eerie wind blows, and um, the producer said, "Wait a minute," or maybe it was Brad, but I think it was the producer. I forget his name now. John um, Smith. John Smith. John Smith. Yeah. Um, so John Smith goes, wait a minute, wait a minute, what, 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 what eerie wind blows? And, and, oh, no, no, it wasn't, it wasn't that, it was that, um, he, he looked at his budget when he saw an eerie wind blows and 
you know, there was like a $10,000 wind machine just for writing an eerie wind blows. And he went, do we need the, ear, you know, the, the eerie wind to blow? And Brad looked at me and said, no, we don't need the eerie wind to blow. And John just, you know, exited out of the budget. Um, so that taught me, well, no, I, let, let, I'll take that back. Brad and Jonathan always said, don't write for the budget. So I didn't. I always just like, let it go. But be and prepared the, to have things let go. Exactly. Yeah. And so you have to, there's, there's a famous expression, I forget who, who wrote it. Um, you, you have to be able to kill your darlings. But Correct. I mean, again, you know, you don't need... I didn't need an eerie wind blowing. And what they did, I think instead was they, they got a cheap um, smoke machine where, where the, uh, the, the wolf came out or whatever. But yeah, I mean, it, it was in my imagination, there was this like storm coming and, you know, this, you know, the, the wolf just appears, the Kaya appears out of the forest. And, and that's kind of how it really, you know, again, came to life and it was wonderful, mm -hmm. but it looks cool. Least, yeah, it was very cool. But um, yeah. And then, um, yeah, I would just go down to the set every once in a while and just see them shooting things. And, um, you know, because they, they were the, the, the exteriors and the interiors and, you know, the usual stuff. And I remember that the reason why um, Richard Dean Anderson got shot was because he... I think he was on, had to take paternity leave. For Wiley was born. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So it worked it right in. Yeah. So, but originally the script was uh, somebody else getting shot, not him. Okay. It wasn't, it, it was a, just an, an, an extra of some, or no, actually, I don't think any, oh God, this is again, when I, I wish that I had my original script, but I think it just, you know, went and almost smashed the uh, the window of the, you know, just like stuck in the in in the gate uh, in in the control room window. They're and, supposed to be pretty resistant to all kinds of stuff. Later on, they definitely are. So staff blasts hit them, and they don't. You know, right? But that was my point. My right. point was this was like the the strongest material in the universe. And that it could even break, you know, shatter this, you know, really strong mm -hmm. control room glass or something like that, um, or at least put a hole in it. And um, so, anyway, yeah, that that happened, and so we had to rewrite it for for Richard being um, on paternity leave. And then, um, yeah, it was just all fun from from there, and I just, you know, kept going. I love that episode. Uh, there's, there's, there's so many layers uh, going on there with uh, the aliens who helped that culture fight off uh, the Gwawuld and how you know for for a really long time they're wiping us out left and right. And it's a good yeah. it's a good thing they send us to like a a holding space somewhere or something when when they yeah. when they zap the people because um, uh, <laughs> they wipe out a lot of us and that would be something that you know once we finally made peace with them. That'd be something really hard to undo. <laughs> yeah. So it's a family show. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, yeah. So I, I guess I didn't talk about my my podcast, but I did. I want to. Yeah, I want to steer into that. Uh, it, it, but before we do so, I want to make sure to ask you again, like we did before the show. You've rewatched your episodes for this. I appreciate yeah. that. Do they ho hold up as well as you expected them to? All these years later. Yes. I, you know, I think that, I mean, absolutely. If I, if I was just discovering this show for the first time, I'd still have that. Oh, these are really good. You know, I mean, it's, it's not like these Comic-Con people are, are going to, you know, Stargate things just for, you know, just, just to dress up. This is a really great show. To, you know, it's funny. It, 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 it has some, you, you get to love the characters. And again, I think that's the other thing that I, you're right, that these were the, the show where we were just starting to learn the dynamic of the characters. And I had the um, privilege, I guess, or, or at least the luck 
of being able to have what 40 episodes that I could, you know, and scripts that I could watch beforehand to really get to get to know. And that's the, that's the art of being a writer. You have to have that ear of the executive producers and, and the evolving of the show and the actors in order to, you know, do it right. If you can hear them and how they would say things and what they would say and, and speak, then, you know, that's what gets you kind of hired as someone who's going to be on staff is because they don't want to be rewriting um, the uh, the freelancers and stuff like that. They they want them to get get it right, you know, the first time or as close as possible to, to that time. So, um, yeah, so when I, you know, watched these uh, again with my with my wife right now um it was kind of i wouldn't say it was rediscovering them the first time but it was definitely enjoying them as i had when i remember going like oh yeah i could write for this show this is this is good i mean this is yeah that that kind of thing so it was really really it, they they yeah they did a great job and Again, during the, this time, it was just the dynamic between the actors was just really, I think, coming to life and, and getting kind of set for the rest of the, the series, at least as long as um, Richard. Right. You know, yes. Um, Seven, eight seasons there. That, one of the things that I think is most <clears throat> concrete about SG-1 so early on is that the characters are working. You know, you go, I'm rewatching Star Trek Next Gen right now, and... The first two years were a mess, you know? And don't get me wrong, there are some diamonds in the rough in those first two years, Skin of Evil and, and so forth. But, I mean, it's like, oof, you know? These characters are taking a long, much longer time to, to find themselves than a lot of these other shows that we have now. And with SG-1, after the first few, you just got them clicking, you know? The, yeah. they, they hired well for this cast. Yeah, yeah, I and... I would the I I think that I I mean I I had no I had not watched MacGyver <laughs> I had not watched MacGyver I just knew him as you know MacGyver and things like that mm -hmm. so again to see this more mature Richard Dean Anderson playing this um, it was again like oh I mean I've heard of this guy I've seen this guy before but mm -hmm. yeah he's he's fun he 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 can I love to write for him. I, I've never shared this story in 175 episodes before, but I was more familiar with Richard Dean Anderson in the miniseries Pandora's Clock than I was MacGyver. So I knew him as the captain of the airplane in that uh, NBC, I think it was an NBC uh, movie of the week. I knew what MacGyver was. I had seen episodes, but I was more familiar with him as that because that got me more than MacGyver did to this day. Yeah. So it's a good miniseries to go and check out if you like low budget, uh, high concept uh shows but uh <laughs> there you go um, we, we have a uh we have hello a, cat a, a new guest yes this is my my cat edie um she is uh she says it's treat time uh oh it's, it's noon but we're going to ignore that dear <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I want to. I want to set Stargate aside uh, for a, okay. a little bit here. How did you discover Solar, and yeah. how true is that second story there in terms of how you got into it in in the podcast? So yeah, it it, it definitely is true. Um, I, I you know when I was um, again a uh, a little kid, I was walking. What did I say in the podcast? Remind me. <laughs> Um, I've, I've listened to the first two. Yeah. So you, you were talking about being in the second one, you were talking about coming across your neighbor in a coffee shop. My neighbor in a coffee shop. Mm -hmm. And he was saying that, well, I don't know how true this is because you specifically say, you know, this, this may not be completely true. Um, uh, talking about the, uh, the Chinese made panels that oh, aren't oh, made. Oh, with... oh, 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 that. Yeah, that is, uh, I, I guess you're, we're, we're thinking of two different things. So in, in terms of the, um, you know, origin of how I got, you know, doing this podcast okay. and getting into solar. So like I said, I, you know, I, I was always a solar advocate since I was a kid. 
and then saw uh, eventually there was um, after I'd left Stargate and um, there was a writer's guild strike and I was out of work for a long time. And I was thinking like, wow, maybe I'm never going to get back on another show. You know, if 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 I'm just going to live on my residuals, uh, that's not going to last too long. Mm-hmm. What am I going to do with my life? And and thank you all. Thank you all for for watching uh, on Amazon and anything else, because that's always a nice surprise when I get a check um, for, <laughs> for Stargate. Um, so bless you all for for doing that. Uh, and buying the DVDs and whatever. Uh, but um, yeah, so I saw a double feature. It was kind of a dark time. And I was like, what am I going to do? And I saw a double feature of An Inconvenient Truth and Who Killed the Electric Car. And it just reinvigorated my imagination for, okay, well, I don't have to be an engineer but I definitely have the communication skills and they need good people to start promoting solar because it's the technology is here. It's ready. And so I did take three courses um, or four course, four solar courses, you know, one about economics, the other one is about technology and how to design a system. And then uh, a little bit later, I launched um, a, a blog about solar um based on you know residential and i was intending to be a solar salesperson um but then um this big renewable energy magazine that's still around today called renewable energy world saw my blog and um they said you know you're putting out some really great information here do you want to do it on on ours and um and so I kind of moved my blog over there and started talking about mar- PR and marketing and things like that. And that got me to, um, yeah, become a big um, kind of solar marketer, PR mm-hmm. person. And I was always thinking, okay, when are we going to get solar into the movies? And, P- you know, this was now my my passion. And I even went to the Writers Guild and asked them, um, you know, can I give a course? Can I give a thing to to other writers about solar so we can start getting solar into movies and plots? And they just weren't into it. It just wasn't there. You know, they they didn't set those things up, at least not in 2014 ish Mm -hmm. time when I had that idea. So, um, you know, again, just kind of not seeing anybody else do it. And we're now in a time where um, and again, for anybody who's um, a writer out there, um, you know what? You don't have to wait for a studio or anything else to pick you these days. You have all the tools you need in this little satellite truck in your pocket <laughs> um, to do anything today. Um, with if you've got a good script and everything else, even if it's just you know basic, I would keep it short if you have low production values. Um, Because people get that. But, you know, you you can see all the YouTube stars that are out there today, including David, David Reed. Um, Yeah. You know, uh, you can really do anything. So I I finally decided, yeah, I I can create a a million solar stories um, in fiction. We don't have to wait for film and TV to do it. And so that's what I've done with um, season one, which I just wrapped. It's 10 um, solar fictional solar stories of different genres and it's again it's called probably true solar stories you can get it on most streaming apps um and they're fun there there's a solar panel high story um, so i wanted to do that genre and that's an ongoing one that i'm continuing um so there are three of in this first season and we'll have three more in season two which is going to be out in the spring um okay. There's a solar haunted house story. <laughs> you're, you're gotten all the all the genres. Yeah, I, well, that was the point. It was yeah. like I want to show my former colleagues in Hollywood that that you know solar isn't doesn't have to be a mystery. And there are three and a half million solar installations in the U.S. today alone. And there are you know two hundred and sixty thousand workers and growing. We've got to get up to actually a million to meet our our climate goals and so and so why 
why are lawyer stories any more valuable than, um, you know, uh, a solar installer story or a, a person going solar story? Um, but but also a certain person who's already gone solar. Um, so again, you know, there's um, I, there is one science fiction one in there that takes place in 2040, um, which is fun and about what what solar sails are going to be like in the future it's kind of twilight zone ish if you feel like that so sure it's called um if you if you go on the site you'll you'll see it's called good afternoon dude i'm solar sam your solar sales bot um and it's it's got a, a, some good twists and turns in there and very comedic um there's an episode of winnie the pooh goes solar because winnie the pooh got into the public domain last year yes and so I wanted to to again show that we could have a children's story that kind of explains solar. So I did it through Winnie the Pooh. Um, and what else is is in there? There's I'm sorry, a, ma'am, but you can't go solar. Yeah, I'm sorry, ma'am, you can't go solar is one that again shows the the good and bad side of solar in, in the sense that um a lot of seniors want to do the right thing and go solar. And a lot of people and some solar salespeople will sell them anything. But the truth is that there are some situations where your house is just not economically right or your, you know, um, your the physics of your house in terms of it being too much shade or face, facing north just doesn't make financial sense. Yeah, it's to not go worth solar. it. So this was this was where a woman, an older woman was determined to go solar and the solar salesperson who was determined not to sell her a, a system um, wow. because it wasn't right for her. So that was a good advocacy one. Um, and there's a solar superhero one where there's a superhero that comes from the sun and he, <laughs> he's having, Tor, you're just coming up with ideas. <laughs> no, they're, and, and they're funny. They're, they're all fine. I also wanted them to be entertaining, but every episode in the show notes has what they call true solar take takeaways. Yeah. So that's the real stuff that comes out, that information that's dropped in every episode. And, and again, a very gentle way, but that's the, you know, the, the real stuff that you, you'll learn about. So if you're looking for, again, we need, um, you know, another 750,000 solar workers by 2030. So if you're looking to transition your career into solar, this is a way to kind of, you know, learn about the industry, learn about the technology in a, in a, in a very general way. And then you can go deeper but this is more in a contextual story, story-based way. So that's that's my promotion for the podcast. Um, thank you all for, for listening. Please, please subscribe. And now back to our original programming of Stargate. <laughs> but I have I questions. I won't. I, won't I have solar you. questions. Oh, please. And we haven't yeah. tied that to uh, to Stargate either. We can do. We can do yeah. both. Yeah, yeah. Um, go for it. The uh, I've heard that the 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 capture efficiency of modern solar technology, like the, 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 the actual energy, the efficiency is what, what, three or 4%? No. Or has that increased since I last? Yeah, that was in the 1950s. Oh, okay. Um, the, the, in, in terms of the efficiency, what we mean by the efficiency is that the amount that when, when a sun, when sunlight shines on your panel, and don't forget that um, solar is for, for electric purposes is, is all about light. Um, doesn't have anything to do with heat or how hot it is. It can be truly cold, but if, a, if the sun is shining on there, that's great. It's just that during the colder months, uh, it doesn't shine that, you, you know, we have shorter days, so you don't Correct. produce as much energy. However, what, what you were talking about in terms of efficiency is that the amount of sunlight that hits the solar panel, um, you know, you could in terms of what the solar panel will generate from that sunlight it you know right now it's it's an average of up into the 17 percent to the, the the highest efficiency ones around 22 percent okay so that means 22 percent of the sunlight that hits the panel actually gets transferred into electricity the, the other um you know 70 80 percent of light unfortunately gets bounces off the solar panel and goes in into the atmosphere so they are again working on things that in the lab right now they're they're 
trying to, or they have shown that they can capture 30% of the light. Um, so that's again, and the more you do that, again, the more you the smaller your solar panel footprint is on your roof to, you know, generate as much energy as you as you need for your home. Obviously, solar does not uh, work at night. But Correct. again, we do have batteries. Well, there's a lot of always, you know, when people criticize solar, they always go, well, it's intermittent. It doesn't shine at night. Well, that's true. But we do have batteries right now um, that are, again, reducing in costs. And um, you can just store your, your solar there. Um, and also, you in 99% of homes around the U.S., you're always connected to the grid. So that's where you get your nighttime energy. And depending on the policy, again, getting too geeky here, um, you get credited for the extra solar that you produce during the day on your bill. Yeah, it's going back into the grid. It's going back to the grid and they are reselling your extra solar power to your neighbors who don't have solar. And again, during the day, you know, whatever you're generating is powering, you know, your computer if you're working from home or or whatever, your washing machine and your refrigerator and everything else. But again, generally it's too much power. And so the extra is going to the utility um, and they're reselling it. And sadly, these days they're crediting you back for, uh, you know, basically 10% of what it's worth. Um, wow. They used to give you the full credit. In other words, if it cost you, um, if your rate was 33 cents a kilowatt hour, like it is here in California in, in average, um, you would get back um, on your bill 33 cents for every kilowatt hour that you sent back. They're now giving 3.3 3 now? Now that, well, now they're going to give you five cents. Yeah. Wow. Starting, Why? Starting, starting in May. Uh, do we really want to get into solar politics? Okay. <laughs> Hashtag politics. Got it. It, it is. I mean, but in general, utilities don't, they, they see the writing on the wall and right. they want to own all the power and they don't want you going more, more solar. Right. Um, God so, forbid you be independent. Yeah. Well, and, and we're going to have stories about that too in, in, in a later, in this season two coming up. Okay. Um, so, do you yeah. do the, the seasons yourself or do you do them in collaboration with anyone? The episodes, so I should say. Most most of everything I write now, I'm doing by myself. Again, you have the, I, what I do have is an editor that mixes in the music. Um, I'm doing, you know, and, and smoothing out the voice. So there's- So you have an engineer. I have an, yeah, I have, I have, an, okay. I have an, a part-time engineer that's, that's working with me. And he's, he's great. Good for you. That's, that's solid stuff. Um, no, he, I, I am, I am all for this kind of knowledge moving forward. And, uh, you know, this is the way we're, we're going. It's, it's, it's baby steps. Uh, it's just the velocity of, of the movement forward. And the, the more ubiquitous some uh, piece of technology is, look at our flat screen TVs, you know, the cheaper they are. We've never yeah. imagined that we could get, you could go out to a, a store and get a, a 60 inch uh, uh, flat screen television for like 450 bucks now and relatively energy efficient one at that too. So yeah. Yeah. we're, we're getting yeah. there. It's just, we need to yeah. arguably get there a little faster. So, yeah, I, I liken this to, um, you know, the cell phone in the 1990s when again, the price finally came down uh, and, and by the way, again, anybody who's thinking about going solar, there are many ways to do it. Um, but, um, you know, essentially, you know, get a home loan or you can get it at least the, the one big impediment is you'll always save on your on your electric bill. If you go solar, the one big impediment is your credit rating. Right. If you've got a decent credit rating that that then you, you can go solar for no money down. Um, in general, wherever wherever you are, but the economics again depends on your utility bill and, and many other factors. Just go listen to my podcast, and you'll learn about all that kind of stuff. Um, Absolutely. But you know, like in the '90s with um, the cell phone, it started coming down in in prices. It wasn't this brick anymore. It was smaller. It was l less expensive, and we started seeing them in like Jerry Maguire saying, "You know, show me the money," and screaming into the phone. And we saw in <laughs> 
you know, the matrix, you know, yeah. that was all about the, the cell phone and things like that. And we, that's what I'm trying to do here. We need to get solar also in there. And, you know, coincidentally, thankfully, um, in terms of electric vehicles, which is in the same kind of thing, mm-hmm. uh, adoption curve here. Um, I don't know if you guys were watching the Super Bowl, but uh, finally GM has worked out a partnership with Netflix. And now anything that's like a modern show on Netflix that Netflix produces, they're going to have electric cars in there instead of gas cars. So, you know, it, it's happening. We're, you know, it's important to see these technologies in in our um, in use in in use but again in stories i mean we mm-hmm. see it on the news and we see it in commercials but that's kind of not the same thing all right back to stargate i know i'm we're probably getting a lot of or whatever solar questions related to stargate that you have the ancients uh, figured out solar uh, way ahead of us with destiny this yes. uh, this little lady right over here um she is powered by the stars themselves, according to yes. uh, Nicholas yes. Rush. So um, uh, there is, you know, there is that uh, that presence for sure in Stargate for the technology. Um, and it's, yeah, uh, yeah, and I and and again in in media today, that's generally where you see solar in, in the sense of like the the film The Martian, right? Um, you know that that that's where it is, or in The Walking Dead um there there's some solar is it so it, it's always in this disaster situation but actually it's in real life right now so that's again why i, I want to do this is to show people that it is all around us and you can be part of the solar life absolutely and i have uh, uh one comment right now from lock watcher if we can get you back maybe we can get a tour of your solar setup ah i live in a condo um and as a result that is again i I don't want to get too much in the weeds but it's too difficult i mean the condo building can do it but in terms of crediting me for that generation if we were to get solar panels on top of the condo um it can't do it however across the street from me there is a building that decided to do that and so it's offsetting the um you know, the hall lights and things like that. And then I guess it reduced the cost for all the condo owners, you know, in terms of their monthly HOA fees, um, homeowner association fees. So, um, so that, that's good. But good. my, yeah, my, my, my HOA has not uh, decided to do that yet. Um, so another hurdle, you know, another just hurdle. time. But, yeah. Making these so things smaller and more compact that. and, you know, yeah. That's cool, Sorry. man. Well, uh, what a good mission to be on, though. All, all, all things considered, and uh, I, I, it's definitely exciting. And I, you know, in terms of, I think both industries, in terms of Hollywood and solar, we, there's a there's a term we call in the industry uh, the solar coaster. There's a lot of <laughs> ups and downs and twists and turns in this industry. That's right. Um, so, and I think Hollywood, you know, has its own roller coaster, as I did. You know, I had mm-hmm. my feast and famine periods, and Absolutely. I think you have to just be prepared for that if you're uh, an artist and in a growing industry um, like we are right now. So, season two's holiday. Yes. I love this story. This is a tour de force from Michael Shanks. I didn't initially recognize him uh, as Vicello. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it's a it's kind of a funny, sci- quirky sci-fi story where, you know, you got people body swapping. Body swapping is, is one of those sci-fi tropes. Uh, tell us about, about Holiday. Yeah. Coming up with, so, coming up with this. I, I remember originally coming to the guys and I said, um, have we ever done a body, uh, not a body switching. What, what I said was, um, cause I was always going for the comedic. I, 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 I love the comedic side of, mm-hmm. of Stargate. And so I said, what if Daniel became a frog and, you know, like a, or, or, or kind of like a, an alien got switched into an intelligent alien, um, yeah, uh, creature of, of some sort that could talk through some kind of telekinesis. And I don't remember which one it was. Maybe it was Brad. Maybe it was Rob. Um, I don't think it was Jonathan. But they, they said, no, but what if he switched bodies with another 
human alien. That would be cheaper. (laughs) (laughs) um, Because they were, again, they were thinking about, okay, that would be a special effect of a frog, something like that. And I said, okay, I'll run with that. So I wrote up the synopsis and um, I did not intend for Michael Shanks to play Michello at all. I just thought they were going to hire an old man. And I don't know if it came from him. I don't know if the idea came from uh, Brad uh, of putting him or and Jonathan of putting him in makeup. But um, man, he rocked it. He, yeah, he, he did. Just, yeah. I can't just, tell that it's him. <laughs> yeah, I, could, no, I couldn't for a long time. Yeah. Uh, my, my wife just watched it with me. And um, so I got divorced and remarried. Um, so she was, she was new to Stargate too. Um, and she uh, said at the end, who played Michello? And I said, look at the end credits. And she was floored. She was floored. So uh, I'm so glad that, yeah, I, I could uh, create that opportunity for him, not not intending to, but that he could do that dual dual road was, role was, was terrific. I loved the, uh, the, it was rare that it happened, but it, it did occasionally happen where we would encounter civilizations as advanced or more advanced than us who were actively fighting this war on their own fronts against the gold and uh, came up with some interesting ways of uh, doing it. Uh, and Michello's technology comes back in, in season season three as well with, with, right. um, with Legacy. Uh, right. This is was was it your idea that he um, put himself in Daniel's body to get away to escape because he felt that he deserved it? That was my yeah. There was this again. If if my memory is correct, I was trying to, like he was definitely in the beginning luring a sucker to switch with him. He was an old warrior who was tired. And um, I think I originally intended it to be Richard for him to switch into. And I'm not sure, again, how it came out in the rewrites, but it it became Daniel. Um, But I wanted him to be this kind of bitter, just tired of, of the war, and wanting to again just take take a uh, the, the original title i don't know if this is anywhere in the um uh the, the out, out there in in the stargate wikis and stuff but the original title was called the imbroglio which is a you know another word for a big problem and to me the thematic problem was Here's this guy who really has been fighting the ghoul and and he's created all these great machines and he just is tired. And the only way that he can get out of being an old man and just kind of get a life back because he sacrificed so much to over, over the years is to steal this you know, other person's body. And so you, you kind of had that dialogue at in the end where um you know daniel is is fighting with um uh Michello. whatever michello, michello yeah, you've you know, stolen about, my life yeah that i yeah there's that again you've stole my life but i deserve it you know saying from from michello and i look at all this machinery that i you know can give you and reveal to you and if if, if i can just stay as daniel just give me a break so that's the other thing I loved about Stargate is that we did have these moral themes going through, just like Star Trek, again, and, and why we all love Star Trek. The, the, there are these kind of problems of like, well, if the devil tried to sell you something, but for kind of a good reason, would you take his offer? And so it was that whole dynamic there. Um, but yeah, and then I just um, went into... Uh, again, that that holiday period where, um, yeah, when he he escapes and what is he going to do with this thing? And I I don't know why there is something around food with 
with Stargate. Um, <laughs> it's just it one of those things. Yeah, we he meets we up with Fred in in Ergo. Yeah, but yeah, when he meets up with Fred and uh, you know he's just acting really weird, and at the same time you just think, ah, oh, he's just uh, some kind of Gulf War vet, and he's a little a little crazy, but he's got money. That's so. exactly right. He's got a card. <laughs> well, one of these um, cards do. Is Fred named after you? Did you already have that nickname at that point of Fred? So again, very, very interesting because up until re-watching these episodes, I, you know, my my solar nickname for Twitter. So again, backstory for 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 solar. Um, when it started in the industry, Twitter was also starting up. And I knew that again, solar tour would not make sense because um you get America. <laughs> America. <laughs> Um, so tour. I needed, yeah. I needed a more, I wanted a more relatable Twitter handle and that then Twitter handles couldn't be renamed with your actual name. And I didn't want Tor Valenza back then. Cause I didn't want to be mixing it up with Stargate. I mm -hmm. wanted to actually people know me for my solar work work. Um, so I thought that I was picking Fred out of, and my middle name is Alexander as, as you all know, but Solar Alex, and I never go by Alex or Alexander. Um, and I just thought Fred was, again, when I was living in LA, there was a neighbor that lived across from me who was very private and um, would never, his name wasn't on the mailbox. And we always wanted to say things to him like, you know, could you take in your garbage cans or something like that? And he wouldn't say it. And so out of convenience, my wife and I uh, just started calling him Fred. You know, <laughs> I forgot to move his his things again. But now that I look back at it, I came up with Fred here in this episode. I mean, because it was a funny kind of name. I just saw that a homeless person named Fred. So I did not realize that my solar Fred name actually comes from Holiday. So uh, <laughs> break, breaking news. That's, that's terrific. Yeah, yeah so. what a what a great um, a great story. The uh, so many of these lighter episodes um, from the show are uh, some of the reasons that I have have grown to love the franchise. When it when it comes down to it, I can put this thing on and I can feel better about my world. It really Stargate really is chicken soup. Yeah, and Holiday yeah. leaves you with that feeling at the end. It's like you know. This guy yeah. didn't get everything that he wanted, but he had a break, you know, and he appreciated right. that break at the end because he eventually came around to, you know, what yeah. I'm doing is wrong. You yeah. know, I can't take this kid's life away. Yeah. So I think I think it was Brad who retitled it as holiday. Um, and again, because I think in in Canada, you don't call it vacation. You call it, you know, you, right. take, ho you take holiday. And I went, oh, yeah, that works. And and it does. I, you know, again, rewatching it all this time later. Um, and and my my wife is also felt like, you know, I'm I'm happy, but I'm sad, <laughs> you know, at, right. at the end. Cause they, you know, they the actors did a great job of of you know giving sympathy for both sides as I intended. Um, so yeah, it was it was, it was just the I it hit the right notes, yeah, for me. Of, of both comedy and, as they say, dramedy. You know? Absolutely. Uh, Tor, how much time do you have with us? Uh, yeah, we can go for another half. Go, go okay. Ahead. All right. Let's 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 hit one more episode then, and then I, I have fan questions, and I'd like to bring you back uh, later on uh, in the next couple of months, if that's okay with you. Yeah. Uh, yeah because I've got a lot more to go through. So I told you it'd fly. I told you the time yeah, would fly. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it really does. Well, I go into so many segues. So. There you go. And th <laughs> that's why we're here. We're here for the segues because it's like, oh, I've got something delicious to share. Um, Legacy uh, yeah. is another Michello story, but like, like ass backwards almost. We only find out like in the last third of the story. Oh, yeah. You know, this the, the, this guy had a greater impact than we were we were led to believe in terms of how he and his tech got around. Um, were you going for a horror story, uh, losing your mind story? Uh, because this one, uh, let me tell you, when I was in uh, my early teens watching this, this one 
sort of freaked me out. This is this is a this this screws around with you coming through the puddle. This this face, you know, and pulling Daniel through, and Jack getting a a symbiote in the back of the. This is not um this is not for little kids. Yeah, I did not intend. I I think I wrote some really choosy roles for for Daniel, and I did not um, for the Daniel character for Michael Shanks, and I did not intend to make this a Michello story when I was starting to pitch it, but I did intend to make it Daniel goes crazy. That was the that was the one liner of like, I wonder if something infected Daniel and you know, something alien infected Daniel and everybody thought he was crazy, but it was really some other type of alien technology. And then I think somebody on staff said, well, why don't we make it Pacello's? Um, so then it all came together, right? The treatment, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So, but I, I definitely remember like, this would be a really good one. Like I, I we hadn't seen someone in a padded room situation one of the characters in the padded room situation let's you know shanks is great at that kind of stuff let's let's make shanks go crazy and then everybody think that he's you know again hearing voices and things like that and of course he really is again in his own head hearing voices and michello and and all that stuff so um yeah it's freaky to watch because um and i didn't intend it to make it scary i definitely that w- it was definitely supposed to be that's that would that was it. It was also intended to be a ghost story. Like okay. I, it was it was Daniel is seeing ghosts, but why is he seeing ghosts? Exactly um, right. And yeah. I I think the 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 freaky thing for me and for a lot of people I imagine who watch is that uh, this can happen to any one of us, and you know <laughs> where it's not there's not an alien excuse. You know yeah. we we develop a a um a complex and mm-hmm. you know there's no one you can turn to and you know there are places like this where people go that's yeah. scary you know yeah. i think there's yeah. little scarier than losing your mind yeah so. and this is you know again even a sanitized version of, of, of unfortunately how at least our system here is in, in the u.s i mean i think there are some difficult situation there. but you know, there are great meds these days. I have a friend whose brother is, um, you know, has severe mental, um, uh, you know, schizophrenia. And he is normal-ish now. I mean, I've, I've met wow. the guy. Um, but it, as long as he takes his meds. Be on your meds. That's the trick. You don't take your meds. You get, you get arrested by the police and hopefully you haven't done anything terrible to yourself or anyone else. It's um, so, you know, it does change the person. Anyway, let's, let's not get, get into mental health, but, uh, but um, I think in terms of, again, if I were rewriting this now, I would definitely have done more research about mental health. I mean, I know it's, you know, again, it's, it's fantasy, it's sci-fi, but I think today's world, you want to be more accurate about how people are treated when they are mm-hmm. uh, having mental illness. So mm-hmm. I would have. I think that. that you could leverage it for a modern audience and still make it just as scary. Oh, yeah. But oh, oh, just for sure. Clarify some points, you know. Um, yeah. I was, I have not seen, there's like a 2018 f- film of, of, The Predator. It was around 2018. I don't know how, but I completely mind hold this film and i was reading the uh the synopsis for it where it basically suggests that this kid who has uh who is autistic uh, he his autism equals uh human superpowers Mm -hmm. and it's like that is a very harmful message to send to families you know who are who are dealing with this kind of thing um that it's it's not it's not accurate information uh, yeah. and the, the film got hit really hard for that. So, you know, we, you have to be, there is a certain amount of stewardship that you have to be aware of when you're putting your pen to paper with intent of a project to go on screen in front of everyone. You know, there, yeah. there's a certain amount of, of responsibility that you have, especially now more than ever with everyone ready to attack you and just yeah. looking for something to get upset about. 
both and, both legitimately and illegitimately. Yeah, that's the good and bad thing about um, social media today. Mm -hmm. I, th I think, you know, Stephen King has talked about this because he's gotten a lot of hate mail for certain things like using the N word, you know, in his novels and things like that. And, you know, his thing is that I am what I what I'm doing again in fiction is showing the stuff that's really out there. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, you know, I'm not saying these things personally. Um, I don't go around saying the N word, but you know, when a character is that bad, I want to show him that despicable. And so he will say the N word and things like that. So it is, um, you know, again, in, in terms of being sensitive to showing conflict that exists in the world, in some ways you kind of do have to do that. So it's, it's back and forth. Like I'm, you yeah. know, for my solar series, you know, I'm going to show both like, like that episode where, sorry, sorry, man, you can't go solar. You know, th there is a hero in there, but there are also some bad actors in the background who is trying to sell this old lady uh, a solar system that she shouldn't be buying. Um, so I think you've, you've got to show, yeah, the heroes and villains um, in, in, in your narratives. Absolutely. Um, in order to have the conflict. Um, so. Uh, I've, I've got uh, fan questions here. Um, okay. uh, a, a few of them here and I want I cannot wait to talk with you about Ergo but if we can dip our toes in it here uh, mm -hmm. Tracy my mod wanted to know can you please share a story about writing Ergo and how did you feel about writing for Dom DeLuise oh boy so Ergo was again I, I don't know why I, I, I do gravitate again towards comedy and um, I, I definitely wanted to, again, that was my imaginary friend episode. In other words, that's how it, that's, <laughs> right. that's how it, that's how it came out. Like, I wonder if, you know, again, one, I don't know, I don't remember how it got developed that all of them had it. What I do remember very spe specifically, um, in fact, this might have come first before the whole concept of Ergo, but I do remember very specifically that what my my what if, you know, what if um, the SG-1 walked into the gate and then came out and, you know, again, they, they think they never, they're, they're confused because they think they never left. And it turns out that they, they've been gone for 16 hours. So that, actually was the window the gate is as you were into the episode and thought, okay what do i do with this like okay what happened on the other side in those 16 hours that they were gone hmm and then it yeah somehow i thought about the well something hasn't happened but something does but something you know it has to be hidden somewhere hidden imaginary friend episode and then it started <laughs> going through so that was the genesis of that and then um i remember having fun with it i think halfway through the i, I think i remember talking to the guys and they were saying you know peter's been looking for something for his dad maybe this one will be it but he didn't want to promise me anything right Peter Deloise. Um, and so I just kept writing it and yeah, I had a funny first, first two drafts. And then I know it was polished by um, yeah, Brad and, 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 uh, and, and Robert. And then um, as I think is well known, Dom Deloise did a lot of ad lib <laughs> <laughs> so I again I would be interesting to see my the, the 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 two drafts and the polish of how how it developed and what actually I came would out love to see them I would love to too but they're locked into you know some old there's got to be a way to dig to to pick the lock there's got to be yeah. um that's it's it, you know there was there was a lot that that was a polarizing episode for a lot of people 
Um, it, in really? a lot of, in similar regards to the episode 200, there are people who, who loved it and there were a handful of people who didn't. And I think mm. that it comes down to whether or not you like that style of comedy. Um, mm. If it doesn't work for you, you know, right. you're not going to enjoy it. But the vast majority of, of fans look back on that episode with like, wow, what a, what a piece of work that was, you know, yeah. it's, a, it's a great show. It, it really was. I, I think, you know, it was great. He gave me a signed cookbook of his um, <laughs> at the end, which is great. And I, it, it, it was, and I didn't spend much time with him at all. Um, I mean, he was down doing, doing this thing mm -hmm. below, but um, I heard again that it was, uh, you know, he's ad living a lot of, a lot of stuff and and you know to the credit of uh both the actors and and the editors um they put it all together in in a way that still made complete sense and as you see the result a lot of fun so you know that's the magic of of film and really terrific actors who can roll with that uh all that kind of stuff so yeah when when you give a a, a juicy piece of content to to the right person they're just going to make a meal out of it so yeah we got yeah. to see that a lot in the show yeah. dan ben uh wants to know were there any deleted scenes or stories that you recall uh that were removed from scripts or threads pulled out of scripts that you really wish had stayed in the show you referenced william faulkner killing your killing your darlings um is there any of that that you can recall specifically uh that you had to to deal with as as you you worked through this gosh it, not specifically okay. no i think there's just always the again i was really excited to finally get my words into an actor's mouth so i think whatever came out of that was always you know terrific and and again to the executive producers and and the set designers everything else they made the page come alive so you know i'm just really grateful that that happened and it 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 you know whatever was left on the cutting floor it had its reasons for being there yeah i yeah. i Again, because because at the, the, you can't have too many chefs in the kitchen. True. So again, Dom DeLuise or otherwise. Yeah, and I, <laughs> I, again, I don't know how others were interviewed about it, but Richard to me was was a good team player. I mean, he did not have like the ego of a star or anything else like that. Like he had corrections. <laughs> I mean, his mom, I think, was uh, an English teacher of some sort or something like that. So he was, um, I remember making like small notes about my scripts, about grammar here and there and things like that. But just because I thought that that's what he would say. Um, but in any case, there's, I think, you know, the lesson for anybody who's on a, a television show is that, you know, the executive producers are you, you ultimately you have to have one captain of the ship and in the case here it was kind of a hive mind of at that time uh, uh uh brad and jonathan and so you know when things got left off i mean there there were you know i know like kind of arguments or not arguments but discussions with the air force because they allowed us to be using them and you know you just had to rewrite it because you know every script had to be submitted to the air force and they had to tell us what was real or what was you know not real and also what doesn't present us well so we can't do that um or we don't want you to do that so again um you know, you, you just have to, uh, again, for anybody who's wanting to be a TV writer mm -hmm. or even a, a, you know, a screenwriter, um, you know, ultimately you have to surrender to to get things done. 
you have to surrender to one person's vision and just do the best that you can for that. For that. So um, I'm sorry that I can't remember anything specific, but I guess that's a way that I just, you know, let, I mean, the, the example is again, the eerie wind blow, like there wasn't a wind machine, but um, in, in spirits, but you know, uh, it still was fun. So. The fog was a great substitute. Yeah, <laughs> it looks good. Yeah. <laughs> Bullseye fourteen twenty three. Uh, on that note, um, Tor, uh, uh, what advice would you give to someone trying to take a crack at getting into television? So, I, I think again to reiterate, this thing is. <laughs> amazing if you want to direct and if you want to you know really do things by yourself just show what you can do with very limited tools um, which are really not very limited these days you can do special effects and so many things with your phone but if you just want to be a writer on television today and again it's been a long time since i I've, I've been a part of the industry but i i still think the same concepts are true and that is what I said in the beginning, write every day. Whatever, you're, if you're writing scripts or short stories or whatever you're doing, um, make that your discipline. That's that's number one. Um, after you have it to a place that you really feel is in good shape, um, then I would, um, you know, submit. And and by the way, there are a lot of great screenwriting mm -hmm. books out there. Um, and uh, if you uh, don't know about it already, there is um, a website called Go Into the, the Go Into the Story. It's run by my friend um, Scott Myers. Um, he's a really great guy, but um, he is a kind of a screenwriting guru type, type teacher these days, and just um, uh, wrote a book. But he does workshops. You know, you can do those kind of things, and. Um, I, th I think you should probably still, you know, submit your scripts to contests that are known contests, not just like anybody's contest because they are they all cost money to do. But if you win those, that that's great. And then, you know, like I did, um, you know, you you got to know people who know people, right? And so you don't know you don't have to directly know something. I mean, in my case, it was kind of really magical in the sense that, um, again, I started getting some really good feedback by people that were usually critical. I mean, friends were usually critical of my writing. So that, you know, finally I'd, I'd written something well, this road movie. Um, and um, at the time I was working at a commissary in the studio system, um, but my uh, sister gave it to, a cousin-in-law of ours, so who was working as a lawyer and in the industry, and a lawyer, and he gave it to um, a uh, an agent um, who ultimately became my agent in the beginning. Um, but at the same time that she got that script from my lawyer cousin-in-law um i also had an internship during my junior year of college with um uh two two writer producers and um their development person was also again she was one of the critical people who never liked my first three scripts <laughs> but liked like this one and said it wasn't good good for her but the first thing that she should do that, that we should do is get you an agent. And so on the very same day, they both, they both sent the script to the same agent at leading artists. Interesting. And so that was, that was really cool. Cause, cause she was halfway into it when her boss um, came into her office and says, I read the first 10 pages of this, take a look at it. And he showed her and she looked at it and saw the cover and says, yeah, I'm halfway through it and I'm loving it already. There you so go. it was just like one of those things. Of, and um, yeah, I had, a, I had a lot of choices back then. But moral of that story is um, look around to see who you know and just try, try to do it. 
Um, you can also go through the slush pile um, uh, in terms of just sending it directly to agents and things like that. Um, don't go for the big people. Go for the, the people that are just starting out as agents. And there yeah, are they're starving for content. Yeah. You know, yeah. fresh faces. Yeah. Yeah. Because they they need to represent the up and comers because mm -hmm. um, they're not going to get the the big ones. So maybe right. they, they want to make a name for themselves and, and for you. So I would I would do that. But the number one thing is like it's not going to happen unless you do the work and write. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think everybody has their own taste and things like that. But, you know, if you again hear the same feedback over over and over again, excuse me, um, you will uh, you should you should listen to that feedback and try to address it uh, as note. best you can. And don't take it personally. The page is not you. Right. That's that's I, I agree. Uh, General Maximus, if you had to pick one of your stories, which one of of your uh, SG one stories is your favorite? I think holiday and legacy. I'm just going to call it one because they are related and. I just really enjoyed that. Yeah, just that that warrior. If I had to choose between those two, holiday. Just I I, I love the, that idea of this guy who just thinks he's earned it and still can't and get it. Um, yeah. So I think I think that. Yeah. I I yeah, I. It's uh, it's just one of those stories that you can choose this one to represent kind of all of SG1 in terms of its its usage of theme the uh the banter between the characters and the 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 quality of the actors and the overall just production value yeah it's all nested together very similarly yeah for sure yeah yeah uh, again i uh, hats off to the set designers and they really just did such an amazing job of creating worlds every every episode it was um just amazing um including that totem pole which i wish i Absolutely. i could have brought home with me but that was big that was a big yeah thing. it was a big uh I plaster i forget what it was made out of it wasn't nobody carved it believe me but uh yeah it, there were it, pieces from that episode that that were I from uh, it when you go into uh, when you went into the the production office and you went through the stairs the one of the bigger set pieces from I believe it was it may have been inside of the temple on the Salish planet uh, was hanging over the stairwell for mm. years um, yeah. so it, there was there was some cool stuff done from that episode yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, Amazon is working, last question for you, um, uh, at some point here on some kind of new uh, Stargate. I don't know if how active they are in it. Um, but uh, if in, if asked, uh, would you be up for taking another another whack at the at the franchise? Yeah, I think I would. it It would depend on, again, who's running it and the vision for it. I, I think what I've learned, um, is don't force a square peg into a round hole, no matter no matter what. And I think that um, you know I, I don't want to fake fake it till I make it mm -hmm. type of thing. So I, I it definitely would be something that is. Um, I'd love to hear the concept, and I don't know who's is it going to be Brad and Jonathan who are running. It don't or? know, don't know. I I think it's less likely every every quarter that we re-examine this, but. Um... Uh, I, I can hope. So we'll see. Yeah. I, I got to have a shout out again to all the fans like you and, and everybody who's following this show and, and all the other shows. It It's one of those things where I, I do very clearly remember um, pretty sure Jonathan uh, was telling me about his old shows before Stargate and saying how you know, I mean, shows come and go and you yeah. just never know where this one's going to do. But I've, I've done a lot of series where I get, you know, again, two cents per episode, um, you know, in, in terms of a, a residual and people don't remember it. 
Um, and at that time, again, he did not know whether this one was going to be remembered, but you guys keep it alive. And it's just so wonderful that it became another iconic thing like Stargate. I mean, it's like, you know, like as, as Star Trek is and, and just has its own life. And so um, I would love to see another one. And, and I hope that it has, again, the same mix of great comedy with, with action and drama. Um, if it ever happens, it's perennial, um, you know, it's not yeah. going anywhere. And, you know, some of it is more relevant today than it was before, when it aired. So. Yeah, I was listening to again, to try to prepare for this, I was, I was listening to other podcasts. And there was, um, you know, this two guy, I think there's an Australian show. And, and again, two Stargate fans listening with a newbie through all the episodes and then commenting on them. And yeah, it was just wonderful to hear those two perspectives of the guys in the know and and the new one who is just like was was shocked at things like again daniel um you know being scared when he comes through the closet and and stuff like that uh through through, through the wormhole that is in in his closet in, in legacy yeah. Um, so yeah it, it's i and the other thing that i have to put our hand again clap the hands for us again for um uh, again, Brad and, and and Robert and and the Mazzolis for I mean for for keeping this alive in the sense of you don't know you know twenty two episodes a year. When I look back on that, that was a lot of writing to do, and they kept it up through sci fi and everything else, and and you know have that imagination. Let me tell you, people, it is difficult to create. 22 you know episodes that have again that without it making it boring and and repeating things and, and things like that and yet at the same time you know keeping kind of the storyline all mm-hmm. together and taking breaks for the one-offs and things like that you know the the arrow you know this was the first time we ever heard of of trinium mm-hmm. and you know it's used got- throughout the rest of the show it was it's amazing I mean, and so so that kind of vision that can say okay what what's in our past and can we use it for you know future episodes and then blending that in again that's how legacy got created I, again it wasn't intended that way to be a daniel thing i mean to be a, a, a holiday sequel but, but it what it yeah, worked it, it worked we got it let's and use you reward it. past viewers yeah, 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 yeah. So again, thank you all for for continuing to and 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 you, David, for doing shows like this and and keeping it all alive. It, it's uh, it's wonderful, and and thank you for, in some ways, and I wouldn't say forcing me, but um, <laughs> inspiring me to rewatch, you know, my episodes and go like, yeah, that that was a great two years, you know, two and a half years of my, my life. So, so thanks. Well, I have about another hour of content to, to cover with you. Will you, okay. would you be willing to come back in a, in a month or two and, and yeah, polish sure. that off? It yeah. means a lot to me to have you. I, I, I will tell you that, you know, past and present and divide and conquer are two of the more vaguer ones in my, my mind, but maybe you'll be able to, to pull it off. <laughs> divide and conquer was a polarizing episode for for the time if ever there was one and past and present returns my one of my favorite villains from the show the yeah. older version of whom we had on last week so oh, that's, yeah bonnie that's, bartlett so bonnie bartlett uh, yeah this is no this is that terrific. one was uh, that again showing how you can tie things together that way and i remember that was one that was brought to me we said brad said we need to bring back linnea yeah and um I said, okay, <laughs> but uh, all right, we'll, we'll try to get into that, but that's, that's pretty much the anecdote that I have. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, w- w- when you and I sit down and schedule, I, I will rewatch uh, those specific episodes and we can at the very least talk about the themes and uh, answer some more fan questions that I didn't get to. So uh, it's a privilege to have you and to talk about uh, your, your current passions. And I think that they are, very valid for us to sink our teeth into and explore further. So Tor, this was terrific. Thank you for having me. Thank you, sir. I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up on this end. You take care of yourself. Okay. All right. Bye. Be well. Thanks.
Tor Valenza, writer and senior story editor for Stargate SG-1. And thank you to Raj Luthra for uh, the question, uh, would you return for any future uh, Stargate series? I, I failed to give you credit for that. Uh, we had a, a more generic uh, question. Are there any episodes that, any other episodes that the titles got changed? I can think of a few the episode in season five, 48 Hours, Joseph Malazzi originally titled Tilk Interrupted. And he went round and round with the production team and they just would not let that one go. And he's like, well, I, well, so it went to 48 Hours. Uh, in season three of SG-1, the episode um, Forever in a Day in German is actually called Share is Dead. Um, so unfortunately, that one gives away, you know, what the episode is about. Uh, and in Stargate Universe, uh, the two-parter Darkness and Light was originally a single-part episode called Fire. And those are the ones that I can just think of off the top of my head. General Maximus, question for David. Are you planning anything special for episode 200? I would love to have Ben Browder on for the big 200 because of his connection with that uh, episode of Stargate. So maybe I can organize some kind of a, a Twitter uh uh, kind of movement toward that. So as we get closer to the big 200, we'll have that discussion. But for episode 199, if we can secure someone special for the 200th episode, I'll go with that. Um, if not, what uh, what my plan is for episode 199 will be pulled into 200, which is to have a big... Um, everyone who's behind the scenes making this channel possible, I'm going to bring them all in and have them share their... Stargate stories. So everyone from Frederick Marcoux through Tracy and Anthony have them all on Darren, Jenny, uh, for just a big family, uh, episode. So that's, that's the intent, uh, there. Thanks again to Tor Valenza for, for joining me for this episode. Thank you to my moderating team, Summer, Tracy, Jeremy, Reese, and Anthony. You guys make the show possible. Uh, my producer, Linda Gate Gabber Fury, for helping me schedule my guests, and uh, Frederick Marcoux at Concepts Web. Uh, he keeps uh, uh, the website up and running. Uh, we have. I I almost skipped over our uh, our lineup for this coming week. We have uh, Morris uh, Chapdelaine. Actor and Asgard puppeteer joining us this Saturday, February the 25th at 10 a.m. Pacific time. So he's going to share some anecdotes about uh, uh, playing Priors and uh, Tenat and Jupe, uh, the or the uh, Orions or Bain. I, I can't remember what their species name was. Saturday, February the 25th at 10 a.m. Then Glennis Davies, uh, Catherine Langford from 1969, and Eli's mom and uh, Ambassador Noor from season seven's. Uh, homecoming. She's going to be joining us February the 25th at 12 noon. The following week, March the 11th, Google's AI advocate Lawrence Maroney and Stargate executive producer Robert C. Cooper are going to join us for an episode on Stargate and artificial intelligence at 12 noon on March the 11th. So that's going to be a big one. And then two hours later, tentatively scheduled, uh, we're going to give you a chance to interview Jack O'Neill, the chatbot AI. So that's going to be interesting to say the least. And that's all I've got uh, planned for you here. My name is David Reed for Dial the Gate. Thanks again to Tor Valenza for joining us. I'll see you guys on the other side. Take care, everybody.